Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm still Martha Minow, and it is just with utter uh, delight and honor that I have the chance to introduce you to Martha Coakley, our Attorney General for years, District Attorney, someone who actually has had a distinguished career not only in public service but also in the private practice of law, and with great courage ran for public office repeatedly, something that I know many of you are interested in doing as well. And she's agreed to have a free-ranging conversation. And so I'm going to start, but I'm planting the seed with you now. I'm very soon going to open it up to you. So I want you to ask questions. And when you do so, please identify who you are. And don't get mad if I cut you off if you go on too long. And we'll give preference to anybody named Martha. That's so. correct. That's correct. This is the Martha Day. No. Uh, truly, uh, you, your career is one that I have admired for so long. And it's because you actually have stood for pursuing hard, hard cases and hard problems. I'd, lo I'd love if you just tell us a little bit your journey. You know, you, you went to college. You grew up in Massachusetts. You went to college uh, at Williams College. Any Williams College grads here? Um, you went to law school, and then what happened? Um, so it, I think that the time that I grew up shaped me. I mean, I grew up at a time when, although my mother hadn't gone to college, my father worked his way through Brown, they had five kids and believed that education was important for their four daughters and their son. And so when I was graduating from high school out in western Massachusetts, uh, out in Berkshire County. Anybody ever been to North Adams? Anybody know where it is? It's way out there. It's almost, it's almost in New York, which is why I say I, I grew up closer to Albany than Boston, which is why I say my R's. And uh, when my two older sisters who went to girls' Catholic schools, and I really didn't want anything to do with that, uh, and Williams was going co-ed at the time, so I went in the first class to go through all four years at Williams, so we were the guinea pigs for co-education. And I believed, and to some extent, um, it, it has been tempered through the years, but I think we all believe that this is great. The world has changed. Now the world will be fair and equal, and we are going to get the same education and opportunities uh, that uh, men do. And I uh, then decided, and ar used to argue with my best friend at college, do you want to cover the news uh, or hmm. make the news? And huh? she ended up going to the Columbia School of Journalism, and I decided I wanted to go to law school. Uh, I watched a lot of Perry Mason as a kid. Uh, and I read a lot of Nancy Drew. And it seemed to me that this was a time where with revolution in the air and lawyering skills, advocacy skills that let you speak for people, that let you uh, champion a cause, would be a place that I would be comfortable, that I would be successful, uh, and that I would like. And that has been true, actually, Martha, that mm -hmm. I am very glad I went to law school. I actually did a lot of moot court while I was there. I was on the national moot court team. And so no surprise that my first job out of law school was doing trial work. And I went to, for about a year and a half, do insurance defense and got me into court filing motions at a time when you mm -hmm. still had to go and argue your motions, not just submit them on paper. Um, it was a time, by the way, still in Boston, when you walked in, you had your little suit on with your bow tie, and the yeah. judge would say, have you filed your appearance, miss? thinking that you were somebody's secretary to come in to get right. a continuance for the right. boss. Because wow. you couldn't only file an appearance if you were an attorney. That has obviously changed. And so uh, through experience there, a year and a half later, I, I moved to Goodwin Proctor, where I spent about six years doing litigation, both big firm litigation, big clients, big discovery, uh, although not as big discovery as now. And, uh, but also got to do some smaller cases and some pro bono work. And I saw, I was telling the dean earlier, that for those firms where often the route to becoming a partner in litigation would be getting some trial experience outside the office, the US Attorney's Office, or some other route, uh, which is what I chose to go to the local DA's office. So at year six, I left Goodwin Proctor and started as an assistant district attorney up in the Lowell District Court. The best job I've ever had was the Lowell jury of six. I had cases huh? for trial on every day. Huh? I had six cases on for trial every day. One of them would go. I just didn't know which one. So that meant you know, a lot of prep for it. But great experience, great fun. Uh, and then I moved my way up through the rank. And I, at that stage, just loved doing the trial work. I started doing more serious felonies. I got tapped to do mm -hmm. our child abuse unit, which was a life-changing, career-changing event for me. And I'm happy to answer some questions about that. But I said to the dean earlier, this was the first job I had where being a lawyer was not enough. 
I had to become a psychologist. I had to work in a multidisciplinary way with other professions, including for kids who'd been sexually abused, understanding ages of competence and how they were thinking about and how they were talking about abuse, but also uh, medical doctors, because we started to see an increasing number of physical abuse cases where the medical testimony was going to be key. Child abuse, but totally different ways of preparing them for trial. Huge education, including one that made me more concerned about how do we prevent these kinds yes. of things, right? Yes. It's not just about you know this case and that case, but what's the big picture here and how do we do better working to require reporting and prevent child abuse? We brought cases against priests, against family members, and so uh, it was really a life career-changing event for me. I ran for district attorney uh, and used that model in looking at domestic violence and adult sexual assault, and that was all very helpful, and I tried to look at ways we could both hold people accountable, get it right, and there's nothing wrong, that, nothing worse than a false claim of child abuse, so they're tough, tough cases. They're never clear, and your victims and your clients, whether you're working on Wall Street or you're working in the DA's office, never come in with a little package and a bow around and says, I have this problem, you have to figure that out. What is it that your client needs? What is it as the Commonwealth, where you don't represent individuals, but you represent safety, taking victims' wishes into account. So it's complicated, but it was very interesting. And then somebody said, run for attorney general. Mm -hmm. I said, I'll have to do utility rate regulation. Why would I want to do that? <laughs> um, but my predecessor, Tom Riley, convinced me that I would love the job, and he was right. Uh, it's an extraordinary opportunity in this state at a time when we were first in healthcare, and we were on the forefront of the mortgage foreclosure crisis because of our great consumer work. Right. We had seen this cropping up with unfair and deceptive practices, and as you may know, Massachusetts really set the table with a case that went all the way up to our Supreme Court that said, if you sell a financial product that you know or should know is gonna blow up, uh, then you can be held accountable for that under state law. You know, banks had always thought, you don't regulate as states, but when you engage in consumer action, we use that tool to bring that case in Massachusetts and use that as a foundation, I think, for what happened around the country, to not only get money back, but then to use it with other legal services around Massachusetts to make sure that not just did people, you know, uh, get the state got money back, but that we would make sure there were no unnecessary foreclosures going forward, that we would give people the help they need to stay in their homes. One of the things I'm most proudest of as a lawyer, as an attorney general, to be able to do that. Um, obviously, DA is an elected position. Uh, I won that pretty easily. Well, no race is easy. Uh, running for AG was relatively easy. I had two races where I was not as successful, uh, running for US Senate uh, and then running for governor. Uh, they were different races, and I'm happy to talk about that. But um, we elect our uh, public attorneys, and we elect our public officials. And I have always felt that if you don't run, you can't win, which is true. Um, <laughs> not everybody can win. And I, I particularly wanted in this last race to send the message to people, I'm proud of the race I ran. We didn't win, but we came in second. And we were very close. And I think we made some important changes in the policies. Uh, that we brought forth, the discussion around child safety is one that's front and center now with the governor. Uh, I still have a good relationship with him and with his, his, uh, many of his appointees. Uh, and I think that I have an opportunity to still uh, be involved in public policy and public safety and the issues that I care about. Meanwhile, I've gone back uh, after a wonderful semester at the Institute of Politics at the Kennedy School. Uh, where I, I say, you know, sometimes people lose races go to, you know, cheer each other up. Uh, but <laughs> we, we, um, we had a great group of fellows, one of whom writes for Time magazine, one of whom um, is now a chief advisor to potentially the next uh, Speaker of the House. Uh, we had uh, Christine Quinn, who uh, ran for mayor of New York. So it was a wonderful experience and met many law students and Kennedy school students through that. But I started back at Foley HOAG at the end of uh, May. And so why back to a firm? Um, uh, I've sort of come full circle in a way. And I was telling the dean that one of my best friends from college, uh, from law school, who is a partner at Devavoy's Plimpton, just left his partnership to become an assistant US attorney in New Jersey. So we have crossed our <laughs> paths completely. I'm a little bit jealous of him, actually. Um, but I wasn't sure what I was going to do. But Foley, HOAG, and some of the people I've worked with and against on cases 
came to me and said, we'd like you to join the firm, would you think about it? And working with people I know and trust in a place where the quality of work is good, there's a lot of uh, pro bono work that they do, I felt that um, it would be a good spot for me, and so far so good. Um, I hate timesheets, I'll tell you that, and for any of you who filled out timesheets, but it's the fact of life, and you know, that's, so I will stop there. I've so given everybody a lot fantastic. of. That's <laughs> fantastic. I mean, you, you, you are modest in the way you describe it. I mean, the work that you did on child protection became a model for the country. The work you mentioned on foreclosure became a model for the country. The work on health care became a model for the country. Uh, and so we, we have just been so very privileged to have you as a public servant. I, I want to ask about um, a, a couple uh, cases just to explore what works, what doesn't work. So take, for example, Massachusetts v. EPA. Yep. So this is, you know it better than I do, but Massachusetts, which we do often think that we have our own foreign policy here, we also um, <laughs> had some view that, that since the federal government was not actually taking action with regard to greenhouse gases, that Massachusetts should. So take it from there. And, and that case was actually brought and tried and, and argued before the Supreme Court under my predecessor, but the decision came in, and the head of our environmental division, Jim Milkey, who did the oral argument, he's now an appeals court judge, rightfully so, uh, did a masterful job of, of taking a theory and challenging a, a federal government agency, which you know is enormous discretion, uh, but saying, you're, EPA, you're not doing your job. And because you're not doing your job, there's an impact on us here in Massachusetts. And um, one of the big issues, as you might guess, was standing. And one of the important facts, facts do matter in these arguments, even at the Supreme Court, facts matter. And Jim Milkey was able to talk about the fact that we were losing a foot of Cape Cod every year because of seas yeah. rising and, and climate change. And interestingly, uh, there was a 5-4 decision with a very conservative court, which was surprising but welcome. And I know Justice Breyer, in public comments to a law school later on, said it was one of the few arguments he had heard as a Supreme Court justice where the oral argument made a difference. And it was a huge tribute to Jim and his immersion in the facts involved with this, the importance of challenging the federal government, who really had the only authority to make yes. these changes, but wasn't doing it. The act of, you know, the, if, you're, cath mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're Catholic, you know about errors of commission, sins of commission, sins of omission. Um, it, first year law students, what's the worst in, uh, error of omission? You know, not fact checking or doing your, uh, your shepherdizing correctly. So, but he really was able to frame that argument in a way that the justices got and was successful. And so I took all the credit because I was the AG when the decision came back, but that's how it works, so. <laughs> Sometimes as attorney general, as a district attorney, you make decisions not to do something. Yes. And, or to settle a case. Yes. So let's identify the big dig was another. Yes, I was going to use that as an example, Wonderful. actually. So the big dig, for those of you who are new to Massachusetts, occupied us for 10 years. Oh, at least. At least. Yeah. So digging up all of the highways and tunnels, and now it's much better, but it was very challenging for a long time. And then there were some terrible accidents. Yes. So um, Boston looks beautiful now, if you've noticed. And part of that was because of this project that was expensive to begin with and doubled and tripled in cost. Uh, it became known as and still the big dig. But the trigger moment for this was uh, the summer while I w t Tom Riley was running for governor against Mitt Romney. Romney won that, as you may know. And I was running for attorney general. And late one night, I think in July or August, uh, 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 Mr. Uh, Devalle and his wife, Melina Devalle, were headed out to the airport. It was 2 or 3 in the morning to pick somebody up. Uh, and one of the tunnels fell on their car and in what was inexplicable, totally crushed half the car and her and he walked away unscathed. So now we have a death, a homicide, allegedly, and we had ongoing civil, criminal, state, federal claims. And so I said to Tom, before you indict on this, let's put this all together, and he did do that. So we worked with the federal government. I actually, in the rare instance, brought in an outside special prosecutor to pull all this together because I knew it was going to take a lot of negotiation. We opened up a grand jury to determine whether we had probable cause to bring manslaughter charges against any of the corporations that were involved with the delivery, the building, the design. 
Um, we believed that we did, and yet we sat everybody down and said, we can go forward with these charges, but we know that if you're found guilty of manslaughter, the, you'll get charged $1,000 under Massachusetts law. And of course, they didn't want the criminal complaint or the allegation, and it was a way to talk with them about, could we resolve this in a way that would make sense for everybody? Um, if we, we had all these theories about what happened, there was one company that literally had used the wrong kind of glue on those huge concrete panels that were holding up. Uh, if you go through the tunnel now, you can take a look up. I think they're all secured now, but you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> but one one uh, wit in the office said, it'd be a good place to put advertising now, because you'll be driving through the tunnel. I mean, we'll be looking. But it was very sad, obviously, for that family. She had children uh, in South America. She had great civil counsel who worked with us to get a civil settlement for her family. But the result of that was getting with the major corporate players a trust fund of over half a billion dollars to put in uh, f with oversight of the federal government to make sure that going forward, taxpayers would not have to pay for what was essentially a flawed tunnel. This tunnel had cut corners. They had uh, put sluicing in the walls that created flooding and freezing. You used um, the wrong glue. And they used the wrong glue, which, as you all know from first year, is pretty bad uh, negligence. Well, but that so. seemed to me a, just a, a classic example of choosing not to pursue what the legal tools were, but getting a better result right. for the Commonwealth. Exactly. So really excellent. One that's dear to my heart, because uh, I work on disability rights, is that you worked with Apple and yes. the National Federation of the Blind to have Apple redesign uh, the iTunes software? Yes, yes. So that is a great credit to your current Attorney General of Massachusetts, Maura Healy. As head of our Civil Rights Division, she took on not only is the challenge to the Defense of Marriage Act and argued that, but started to look at technology and under the uh, ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, ways in which access uh, was not designed, but could be if they just thought a little bit about it. Uh, and uh, all of these I'm making very long story short. But um, we start out, as we often do, with a civil investigative demand, the CID, to get some information uh, from Apple about what's your process, what are you doing, and after we do that investigation, we then will usually sit down with uh, the company and say, you know, we think we have enough to bring a claim against you, but what we're really interested in is seeing if you can provide appropriate software uh, in the instance of people who are sight impaired, uh, the ability to use software and iPad tablets, which they agreed to do, and we had a wonderful uh, agreement on the settlement out at the Perkins School. It was fabulous to see these Fantastic. kids so excited. Um, the other one was with the chain of movie theaters to make sure that they were providing appropriate accommodation to people with hearing disabilities. So that kids, and if you think about it, what's, you know, going to movies with your friends, with your family, with your, on your first date, but people who can't hear don't get that opportunity. And the Theaters agreed that they, with technology, they were able to provide in certain seats the ability for someone who couldn't hear um, to get the sense of what the movie was about and go with the family and eat Absolutely. popcorn with everybody. Sit and, together. Yeah. yeah, and it was extraordinary results. Maura, through her foresight about what technology could do, what they could be doing if we just prodded them a little bit, was able to get those um, uh, agreements. And then, of course, you know, um, she argued the Defense of Marriage Act. Ours was not the case that went up to the Supreme Court, but I think it's an early case. Our case and the amicus briefs and the work we did here was as important as the single case of Edie Winsler, who had mm -hmm. a tax issue, so that was important. But we brought in the real human side Absolutely. of veterans who couldn't be buried with their spouses or the thousands of benefits, federal and state, that you were treated differently if you were married under Massachusetts law but not under federal law. And remember, we didn't challenge nationally that everybody should be allowed to be married. Our argument was, in Massachusetts, our courts have said, we provide marriage equality, so federal government, you can't tell us in Massachusetts uh, that we can't do that, and you're making us discriminate in many ways against our uh, citizens here, our residents here. And of course, that, in a very quick order, you can see what happened 
uh, warns people, said, oh, the world doesn't fall apart when we, let, uh, when we bring in marriage equality is actually a good thing. Uh, and so it was also uh, just a brilliant legal strategy because federalism was an issue that would attract some support the, when the underlying issue might not. And so well, and we used it in an yeah. unusual way, right? If you think of the civil rights and the federal government coming in to enlarge civil rights in states yeah. that suppressed it on voting, on race, we turned it around and said, "Wait a minute, we're ahead of you, federal government, on rights." And so you know, we're going to challenge what you're doing, different from EPA, but a similar idea saying, let's look at these constructs and say, what are you doing with a, a DOMA? And we were able to successfully get a judge and several judges to say the only purpose of that statute was to discriminate. There was no other arguable benefit from having a Defense of Marriage Act at the federal level. So it was very clever lawyering and great fact work. And Mary Bonato, who put, uh, you know, Put, brought the first case in Massachusetts in 2003 with the decision in 2004 in Goodrich, uh, and thinking about how do you Strategy. present the human face to this yeah. was really important in putting that case together. So I just, I'm going to ask just one more question and then open it up. Um, you have not shied away from controversy. You have been involved in the buffer statute with regard to uh, space around abortion clinics. Yes. You uh, have been involved in prosecutions of priests around child sexual abuse. You've been involved, we've talked about equal marriage, we've talked about the EPA questions, and you have also run for public office multiple times. How do you deal with what are the pressures that are personal pressures that come from dealing with such high profile, often controversial issues? I'm just stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have always, I mean, I became a lawyer because I wanted to do work that I thought was interesting and in, in important that would make a difference. And so I've tried to follow careers and jobs that would let me do that. In fact, people say, some people say you have a lot of experience and other people look at my resume and say, you can't keep a job. Um, <laughs> because I have done a, a, a lot, lot of different, of different things. things, but that was always sort of my goal to uh, grow on jobs, to learn skills, to figure what I liked about that job or didn't, and was this a place I wanted to be for the next five or ten years? If not, where, where did I want to go where I could contribute, where I could do something? And by the way, I say this, this is about, I think, doing, there's nothing wrong with doing well. I think people can do well, but also do good, that lawyers have a unique opportunity to make a good living, to have a nice home and family and satisfying work, but they also have an unusual and I think uh, unprecedented opportunity now to make a difference and to do good. And that is in lots of ways, the portion of your career that you spend in public service or uh, if you go the big firm route, making sure that the firm itself, as many do, do pro bono work on individual cases or as one firm, uh, give money to the city, the schools in the city of Boston, I mean lawyers can and do have a huge influence. And one of the things we talked about earlier that I'll throw out to you as a challenge is thinking about the delivery of legal services. You have all chosen to be lawyers uh, because there's something about it that you like or you think will give you a good living or that you're interested in it. But we have an unprecedented need, but an unprecedented ability to say, how do you provide a voice? Because that's what you do as a lawyer, right? You're a voice for your client, whether it's a state or a criminal defendant or a victim or a small business owner. How do you provide that voice and how do you, uh, you know, within the bounds of your profession, advocate zealously, but not just to win, to try and get the best result for your client at the time. And as an attorney general, as a district attorney, my job was not to win, it was to get the best result for my client. And I've tried not to forget that. I remember early on a colleague who said, you know, all lawyers do is speak for someone else. Um, and you do get to choose who you speak for and uh, sometimes what you say, depending on your client, uh, but who you speak for determines what you're going to be able to do. And there are just lots of ways, more ways than any other career or profession where I think you can make those choices uh, and do good and do well. And you have huge opportunities now, uh, whether it's environmental work, whether it is on access to justice, uh, whether it is just in making sure we clean up the way our big corporations do work. There's a big, uh, a lot of work around corporate social responsibility. Uh, the firm I'm at now has a division in Washington and that's the work they do, advising clients 
So I'll just throw out Volkswagen to you, right? How does that happen? Well, uh, it shouldn't, so that's a challenge for you. You look at legislation like in California, you can agree with it or not, but it requires transparency in the chain of distribution that doesn't tell people what to do, but it says you have to let consumers know who you're buying from. Is the product of cat food uh, that you're buying somehow put together by you know six-year-olds in Thailand? Um, some people want to know that. And you know, sunshine and disclosure is the best way you get those changes. But finding something that you care about, that you're good at, pr presumably, uh, and that you think uh, will make a difference is something you have an, a, a great opportunity to do. All right. So if there's an empty chair next to you, raise your hand because there are people standing up. There are a couple empty chairs. So if anyone wants to sit down, you can go um, do that. And, and who would like to ask a question? We have before us one of the finest lawyers in America <laughs> who has done pathbreaking public service work and also moved back and forth between public service and the private bar. Who wants to ask a question? There's one back here. And please identify yourself. Thank you. Hi, my name is Chen Yuan. I'm an LM student. Um, currently, I'm taking Kong Law with um, Ding Mino, 14th Amendment. Um, so I'm wondering, um, as serving as uh, a Massachusetts Attorney General, how do you uh, figure out the meaning of constitutional law uh, to build up your legal argument? And what kind of advice you have for a student who is right now uh, struggling with the constitutional law and feel like <laughs> <laughs> everyone understand this constitutional law better than her. Thank you. Well, first of all, that's probably not true. They may pretend they do, but they don't necessarily. Uh, it is complicated, which is one of the, lucky for us it's complicated because then you have to go to three years of law school so you can uh, <laughs> begin to understand it and learn the right language. And I joke only a little bit about that. Um, but if you uh, take a step back, maybe, and I don't mean in a Justice Scalia textualist sort of way, but if you take a step back, and I think it is important to look at what an incredible miracle that document was. If you are a history student at all and you understand what an incredible miracle this country is, as awful as it can be sometimes, and you know, there are the swings of history back and forth. You think about the Civil War, it almost imploded. You think about times uh, like now where our government may shut down again. It's not the worst time we've ever been. But those challenges have survived what were, frankly, a couple of guys in Philadelphia, you know, figuring things out because they cared about and they thought ahead. They made it elastic enough to look ahead, uh, but with enough, you know, precision to give us a roadmap, and people don't always agree on that. But that's the beauty of it. If you think about what is this trying to do? What does the First Amendment mean? Well, it depends, right? It depends on who you're talking to and what the circumstances are. So being able to understand the history of this country and what that document meant is important, but I think it's also important to see how it's evolved in the context in which we put it now. And so, um, believe me, there are law professors here and all over the country who will be spending the rest of their lives arguing about this. So you should not feel bad that it, <laughs> it seems, seems a little difficult to you now. But it's important and it's interesting. And it really gives us the key, I think, to the ways in which um, state government works, municipal government works, uh, and why this country is different from every other country in the world. So, uh, Next question. One over here. Just identify yourself. Thanks. Hi, my name is Malhar. You mentioned that when you started your career, you realized that being a lawyer wasn't necessarily enough when dealing with survivors of sexual violence. And I was wondering how you enhanced your education, and if that was outside of work, how you had time for that. Um, it's a good question. My job as chief of the child abuse unit, for instance, to do that right required me to work with people in other disciplines. So we did this in a variety of ways, through training of police, training of our staff, uh, collaborating with expert witnesses on cases where we had difficult either psychological issues uh, or physical issues. I'll give you two examples of that. Um, at the time, we had adult victims who came back with so-called recovered memories. Uh, and they, uh, we thought from uh, this, the, the discipline of psychiatrists, there was some uh, belief that that was 
um, at least something we should look at. But from the rules of evidence, it was going to be very difficult to put a victim on the stand and say, well, I didn't remember this then, and I don't remember it except I've recovered this memory. So from a practical point of view, it created an, a probably an almost unsurmountable legal issue, but it led us to think, well, what, what does that mean about trauma and the way people block it out? And using experts to help us decide it. And that's what happened in many civil cases where the standard is different and no one was going to jail, but it helped us as we've learned how people's minds work and how four and five year olds deal with abuse, particularly chronic abuse, it was important. On the physical abuse side, and I'll just say this, we had a small number of physical abuse cases when I came uh, and that started to grow. Kids who had metaphyseal fractures and broken arms, head injuries, brain injuries. Uh, and some of you may be familiar with a, another case out of Newton, Massachusetts, the nanny case yeah. where an au pair we claimed had shaken and slammed a baby, eight-month-old Matthew Epen. Fractured skull was only the evidence of the force. It wasn't the injury, it was the impact and the brain swelling for this child essentially killed him and when he was taken off life support, uh, he died. And she was charged with first degree murder. The jury came back with second degree murder uh, and the judge reduced it to manslaughter, which was his right, although I don't think he was correct in doing that. But, um, and it's an issue now because yes, the, is. the pendulum is swung, so there are a lot of defense lawyers and defense counsel saying, oh, that's just junk science. That is, now, I always think you have to look at the bias of where people are coming from. I don't want someone wrongfully convicted on physical abuse either, but I think we have to get at how we protect kids and knowing outside of the adversarial context, what is, mm -hmm. What is the, you know, the doctor I used to work with said, child abuse is like real estate. It's location, location, location. When you hear, how many times do you hear a kid has fallen out of the second floor, or the fourth floor window in an apartment building? They rarely die because kids are very uh, well designed uh, to withstand that kind of accident. They fall off changing tables all the time. Kids are very resilient. But when you intentionally take, particularly a young infant, and shake, you will get injuries in the upper arms and legs that don't happen any other way. You will get that kind of fractured skull, retinal bleeding that doesn't happen if you've fallen out of a window. And so looking to the forensic evidence has been important. And working within my job to educate myself and other professionals to help me do that job better was really the way I did it. And also with advocacy groups, working with those who uh, taught me a lot about victims and how they think and how we need to deal with them in the criminal justice system. So that helped me evolve. But I think when you go into an issue, even if you're just doing a little piece of research on an assignment that a senior partner gives you, the extent you can figure out how that fits into the bigger issue will help you do your job better, I think, and will help you grow and give you some interest in what the final result is going to be. That one of the issues, I think, for sort of big firm uh, assignments right now is you get a piece, you feel like a little bit like you're on an assembly line. Uh, I always want to know, what, well, what's the end game here? What are we trying to do? What are you trying to accomplish? And that's how you will become a better lawyer if you ask those questions and then seek out that legitimate information that may help you understand it better. Part of that bigger picture is thinking whether it's in these public contexts or private contexts about prevention. And yes. you've done that throughout yes. your career as well. And that, that may be legal, but it may also, again, involve talking to people in other fields. How do you prevent the problem? Exactly. Uh, one of the key ways that we prevent child abuse is by mandated reporting, because who are the abusers of kids? Those who are close to them. Most of the abuse is by caretakers or trusted family, friends, members. If we don't put the obligation on a teacher, a doctor, a whole range of people with whom the child may come into contact but is outside that circle, we will never, and that's what happened for too many years. This, the secrecy around child abuse and perpetrators' ability to do that, frankly, is what allowed you know priests. Uh, the church knew it, lawyers knew it, those cases got sealed, and the priest went to another parish, and guess what? You know, the one thing uh, I've learned is that when you have a sexual predilection for children, it doesn't necessarily change because you've done 30 days in jail, or uh, you know, people can do 10 years for bank robbery, they don't walk out and say, oh, I can't stop myself from going into the city bank to hold it up. We use prevention and deterrence in ways that we hope will prevent another victim, uh, but it's been, just, it's been troublesome with sex offenders because of the 
psychology and the way that works. And we've run into constitutional issues, for instance, with sex offender registries. We've tried, and I'm not taking a position on them, but as we try and do something, we run into First Amendment issues uh, around that. And that's where lawyers are important, and lawyers understanding the context. And where can we you know, curtail people's ability to be dangerous but not interfere with their rights? And we don't always get it right. It's never, it's never perfect. And we know we have wrongful convictions, and we know that people don't always, you know, you'd hope you don't have that. I think we have fewer of them, but we still have to guard against that all the time. There's a question here. Say who you are. Hi, my name's Raj. Uh, thanks so much for taking the time to come here. Um, as a 1L who's interested in running for a polit uh, political office one day, can you talk about some of the uh, lessons you've learned, both from the victories you've had and from the defeats? Sure. Um, well, good luck to you. <laughs> uh, I, I mean that seriously. I think it's very important that you, you all think about uh, putting your hat in the ring or supporting those who do, because we otherwise we won't get change. Um, it's hard. Races are hard. The scrutiny that everybody runs, uh, particularly if you're watching at all the Republican primary and what's happening, it's relentless. Uh, uh, the media is relentless. The uh, pace of trying to raise money is relentless. Um, but if you want to do it and you have a good organization and you're committed to it, uh, it can be very rewarding. Uh, I don't regret the two races I lost, by the way. And I uh, learned a lot from those races, some of which apply. Every race is a little different also. I mean, there was a very different dynamic after Ted Kennedy died and I won the Democratic primary, nobody, nobody thought that whoever the Democratic nominee was wasn't going to win. Mm -hmm. Republicans elsewhere thought that, and they poured money in, and health care was a big issue that we hadn't really identified as, the, as you know, so my opponent ran on the, I'll stop health care, and that was successful. He also ended up with, at this time, it was a huge amount of money, and especially he had $7 million in the bank the day after the election that he couldn't even spend. Money came pouring into Massachusetts to turn on a vote and make sure that he was elected. Because it wasn't about our race. It was about national exactly. politics. Exactly. And that, that's something I hadn't really grasped, and I'm not sure our team had grasped as fully as we needed to. In fact, no Democrats around the country had. Uh, many of them came up. There were people came up to raise money for other Senate candidates in December. And we said, wait a minute. We need help. And he said, no, you're all set. You're, you know. So it, it, I'm not blaming anybody. I'm just saying every race has a context. Um, but I encourage you, go hang around the IOP. You'll pick up some good the Institute tips. Institute of Politics in, at the Kennedy School. Yes. yes. You'll pick up some good tips. Um, and it, it's, I love it because it's bipartisan. And it says, I think running for office and serving the public uh, is a noble uh, enterprise. And the, unless we have good people willing to do it, the public is going to can say, oh, those politicians. So. How about the fact that we do elect our uh, attorney general? We do elect. Uh, our district attorney. Some people think that's odd. Yes. What would you say about that? What would you say about the races <laughs> involved there? Well, um, 45 AGs are elected. Uh, in New England, interestingly, uh, New Hampshire, the governor appoints, as in New Jersey. In Maine, the uh, legislature elects. In Tennessee, the Supreme Court elects. Oh, I didn't know that. And in Hawaii, the governor chooses. But the others are elected. Ours is constitutional. You know, there are six constitutional officer, officers in Massachusetts elected by the public. Uh, and I, I said to the dean, I have had this discussion with Professor Dershowitz uh, when I was DA. Um, I think that there are uh, advantages and disadvantages to each. Do not think that you get out politics or partisan politics by just doing an appointed position, particularly because whoever appoints you is your master now, right? Mm -hmm. If you're elected, you answer to the people. And if you're not elected, you answer to whoever your appointing authority is. So there are those who would say DA shouldn't be elected, but I actually think um, you can look at appointed US attorneys or others who have been engaged in overzealous sure. prosecution. Sure. So uh, you can think of certain, whether it's Democrat or Republican, people who've been appointed who forget the fact that they are supposed to represent the Commonwealth or the government and the people of the government. So I still, I come out on the side of the elected is better because you have to answer for what you do and you do have to run every two years or four years. In some states it's two. Uh, and you have to stand on your record in a way you would never have to if you're appointed. So do you want a governor picking someone that he owes a favor to to be the DA? Or do you want someone to have to run 
And yeah. actually, by running, you get to know everybody that you then have to get input from to do a good job as you get. Your police, your fire, your teachers, your community leaders, your advocates. Uh, and you learn by running uh, things you don't when you're appointed. Uh, I had a friend who was appointed DA because there was a vacancy, uh, and he got used to being DA. He had never run, and he got beat the next time because he wasn't used to it. So uh, I, uh, some positions probably should be appointed. I don't think we should elect our, uh, our, our, our attorney general. You know, I think it's appropriate the president appoint an attorney general. But in states, I think elected AGs make some sense. Certainly responsive to the community. Yes. One more follow-up on the election question. You mentioned immediately the coverage of the media. You've now been on both sides. You've also been a media commentator. And so what would you say to someone who's thinking about running into office about dealing with the media? Understand how they work. You need to understand what media does. And you know, uh, and uh, just I ended up uh, while I was at the Kennedy School commenting for Channel Five on the Marathon bombing trial and on the Hernandez trial. So I'm just the legal analyst. I say I'm not really a lawyer. I just play one on TV, <laughs> um, and that was fun for me because I love trials and I knew the cases. Uh, and I have had a chance to become an expert on football law because they called after Goodell's decision came out. And I actually was appalled by how unfair it was. And I love Judge Berman's decision. I think it was an epitome of fairness. Not, and I'm not necessarily the biggest Tom Brady fan in the world. I love Tom Brady, but uh, I don't, I, I don't, uh, that came out the wrong way. Uh, my husband is a bigger football fan than I. But I care about fairness, and I care about process, and I care about the ways in which if you have a lot of discretion, like the football commissioner does, you can use that. But if you step over that line, and Judge Berman said you did, and he set up, I think, a beautiful decision that makes his decision almost bulletproof. Because he didn't say, well, I find the balls weren't, right. you know. He went to the process piece, right. and he has enormous discretion as a well-respected federal district court judge. So process matters. And by the way, if you haven't taken administrative law, and you're interested in public service, that's where the battle is, right? EPA, agencies, agency discretion is huge. And you will uh, have a hard time you know, going against agency work. It's where a lot of good decisions come in. Why we need good people in the SEC and all of those alphabet agencies at the federal level and the state level. So but we, I, I've, I've gone off the, the no, question. No, no, we, we now require every first year student to take a legislation reg regulation class. But I also recommend the administrative law class, which is more advanced work. So you can't leave here without being exposed to administrative law. And I think law. that's really good, yeah. because you need to. But on the media question, understand that the media now is also a business. And they have deadlines, and they have things that they compete with. And I think it's very different from the Walter Cronkite days that you may or may not remember. Um, <laughs> and I think that um, you have to understand their people. And I've developed a pretty good relationship with many people in the media, as you do on the trail. And you uh, have to understand that whatever you say or do now, other, it's different from 30 years ago or even 20 years ago, is captured forever on some YouTube video or somewhere. Unfortunately, I think what it means is that candidates do sound scripted, they do sound a bit robotic, um, and they have to, because you otherwise you're gonna get sliced and diced and not treated fairly. So if you're gonna run for office, you need a little media training, but it's doable. And if you look good on TV, you got a good shot of getting elected. <laughs> Next question, over here. Let's say who you are. Hi, I'm a mom with 3 L, my final year. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. I worked hard to get here. <laughs> um, my question is, I, I want to know what internal struggles you go through when you're making those career transitions, and how do you deal with them? Because I'm sure all of my fellow classmates have had sort of the question, where do I go next, and why am I doing it? So that's a good question. I had that chat with someone just the other day. I uh, never did something to do something else. And this, this was the first time, actually, in deciding what I did. Would I go to Foley? Would I go work for not-for-profit? What would I do? It's the first time I've had to consciously kind of make my list. What do I want to do? What do I like to do? Mm -hmm. Because the other opportunities kind of came to me. right? I wanted to do litigation. So I interviewed not at big firms, but at an insurance defense firm, because I knew that would get me into court. I then said, I don't want to do tort work for the rest of my life, and had a chance to go to a big firm, uh, and then said, well, I really need more litigation, and that's everything else kind of, I don't mean to sound arrogant, it kind of happened yeah. 
but I feel like I did a good job everywhere I was, and I was clear about what I wanted to do and what I didn't want to do, and that narrowed things down for me. Uh, your, your first job out of law school, not going to be your last. N nobody goes anywhere where you stay there, and it could be, but it's unlikely, and I don't think you need to think of it in that way, but I think you need to think in terms of while you're here getting the skills and experience that will help you make those choices and do well at those first jobs, and no job uh, should be discarded. You want to do well, particularly as lawyers, you need to do well at everything you do because you don't want bad reviews. You always want people, even if you're leaving, to say, we're glad you're here, we're going to help you. I've always gone back to people I worked with for the next uh, recommendation, for advice. So don't forget, every place you work, you've got to do as well as you can, even if you know it's not where you're going to be for. Uh, but you know, the, as you look for jobs, make your list. What's important to me? What do I want to do? Uh, you may find there's no job that fits all of those things, but uh, you know, you, you you mentioned relationships here, and you've had relationships that have been very important to you yes. in your professional life, and uh, people who whose career steps you followed or who assisted you. How would you advise people on that front? Well, you d don't. You, your biggest resource in your your first job will be the people you're working with, the partners you do work with, the friends that you make. You know, uh, I actually had a great chance to work with Emily uh, Nash this summer uh, because I found out she'd already done a paper on McCullen versus Coakley, uh, and I needed someone to help me with a webinar for Planned Parenthood. So Emily volunteered, uh, and we have become fast friends. And so being able to work with people, and you're not going to be fast friends with everybody you work with. Believe me, I'm not. But you treat people with respect, and you look beyond the, OK, I've got to get this assignment done. Um, and that also helps you decide, are these people that I want to spend right. 20 hours a day with? Are these people, right. do they share my mission? Right. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. You'd be surprised. The person that seems unfriendly and too busy uh, actually does a lot of time in a not-for-profit. I'm always amazed at people. So take time to figure out who those people are, because Every time I've run for office, the people, every firm I've been, I go back and say, I need your checks, you know. Um, <laughs> but if they like you and respect you, even if they don't agree with you on everything, they will contribute to you as people will vote for you. I've learned this sometimes the hard way, but it's not so much that people think I did this case well or that case well. They trust me to do the right thing. They trusted me to be DA and AG. Um, they didn't quite trust me to be senator because they didn't want health care. I mean, I'm, I'm overgeneralizing some of that stuff. but. Um, and be trustworthy yourself. You know, you're, you'll get as much as you give on this in terms of relationships. My dad, who's a lawyer, was asked by a summer associate, how do you, how do you get the appearance of being trustworthy? And he said, <laughs> actually, it helps by being trustworthy. <laughs> yes, um, it does. You know, related to this issue is culture, the culture of different offices. Yes. Uh, what, how, what, how do you determine the culture of an office? What matters in seeing that? I mean, and how is the boss, do you set a culture? Um, well, that's a good question for those of you who may start your own firm. Uh, there are a lot of people who said, you know, I want to do this kind of work, and this is the culture I want in terms of hours, family, the balance issues, whatever. So, you know, look, law firms have a certain model. They vary a little bit from place to place, but you should understand how they work and how you fit into that. and then. You know, if the culture is one that's respectful and friendly, even though hardworking, and you like it, that's great. But if people at a place of work, whether it's a law firm or even a client you're working for, don't respect each other, I think that makes it harder yes. for you to, and there are places that you can either join or start that, you know, carry those values. And I, I can't emphasize that enough. I think yeah. you want to never give up your values. You may have to put them by the side for a minute in terms of time and work and assignments, but over the course of a lifetime, your values are what are going to make your career, personally or professionally, uh, worth it to you. You know, you don't, who is, I had dinner with somebody recently, and she's been a litigator for a long, uh, yesterday, she's been a defense lawyer for a long time, and she just looked at me and she said, you know, Sometimes I wonder what this was all for. Wow. <laughs> um, no, and I think, and I said, don't worry about that. We all ask that at our <laughs> age, you know. But keep, ask yourself these sure. questions. You know, sure. what do you want on your tombstone? What do you want people to be saying about you in 10 years? Um, and use each other as resources, too. You know, you're all great, smart people. You're all very competitive. But mm -hmm. uh, you are going to be 
uh, potentially lawyer client. You're going to be working together. You're going to create a network here that will help you when you run for office. Call them all up for big checks, right? So, you know, don't, you are very, I, I just happened to see looking at the website, there's a 15% acceptance rate for people who apply to Harvard Law School. So that's pretty extraordinary because it's also a self-selecting group that yeah. applies. Yeah. Um, you, for whatever reason, are very lucky to be here. And make the most of it. You have an incredible opportunity to do that. But don't ever think that it will be easy or that it will come without work or disappointments or mistakes. Um, you will screw up in your jobs. Don't go hide your head at your desk. Go to the person you work for and say, gee, I'm sorry. Can I, how can I do this better next time? And I mean, that's one of the lessons I've learned that you know, we're never perfect, and you'll, you're all going to make mistakes, but go back and ask, what could I do better next time? We all fall down. The question is how you get up. Exactly. So one last question. Oh, well, maybe we can get maybe two. Maybe we can do two. Let's do two. So my name is Emily Ruby Phillips, and I'm hoping you could discuss the Attorney General's ability to refuse to defend the Commonwealth or one of its laws. Yes. Thank you. Nice. Can, let's get the second one in, too, OK? Hi, I'm Heather Waddell. Thank you for coming. And I was wondering if you could give advice on what kind of experience is necessary to do the work that you do at this level. Great. OK. Wonderful. So the, the, the uh, Emily question is a little complicated, but one of the things about being independently elected constitutional is that I don't have to do what the governor says. And I make my own decision about whether a statute is constitutional or not or defensible. And actually, a good example I'll give you uh, of the Justice Department. When we were challenging the Defense of Marriage Act, I called up the Justice Department and said, I hope I called up someone in the Justice Department. I just didn't call it Justice Department. Um, I, I called up the civil rights chief that we had met. And, and uh, I said, I hope that we can do this in a uh, civilized way and not be too adversarial. Um, but they had to defend the statute because in the First Circuit, the burden was pretty high for us to get over. Interestingly, I think because of our discussions in Discovery, when the case uh, started in the Second Circuit, they took the position that they couldn't defend the statute because wow. they said the standard wow. is lower uh, and we can't get over that. So that was a big win, but that was, I wow. think, working with them. I don't think they wanted to defend it, but they had to defend it. You have an obligation to do it. We've had some tough... Uh, child abuse cases where outside groups have come in to say you're not treating your foster children fairly. On one sense they were right, but the theories they brought and the legal issues they brought and the remedy they wanted was not in the best interest. And we tried to settle that case with them. We said, look, we, we want to do better. They didn't want to settle. They wanted a consent judgment. So our job was to defend it. But I think you always look to what is in the best interest of your client. And sometimes litigating it unless you believe the statute itself is unconstitutional or indefensible and you have the right to say, I'm not going to do this. We've done it once or twice and we sometimes get outside counsel. You've seen that happen at the federal level where the DOJ wouldn't defend a statute and the Republicans right. hired outside counsel. Right. So lawyers get to do that. And I think it's always important to make sure if you're going to defend something, you have to do it zealously. Okay, and I'm sorry, just remind me. I, I'm, I can do one question. You're quite, oh, sorry, my fault. You, you asked about what experience you need for the job? Is that? As attorney general. If you want to be attorney general? Um, I mean, I think a, a mix of public service and, and private practice experience is good. I think as attorney general, I, there were many things I had no idea about energy. You know, I got a quick education in healthcare, but one of the things we did because we knew healthcare was going to be a big issue is. I brought smart people in to help me with that. But I think litigation experience is helpful. Uh, a certain subject matter, some criminal work is important, but not necessarily. A lot of AGs don't do criminal work, by the way. Some of them just have civil jurisdiction. But I would say for public service, getting skills around litigation uh, 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 and then some kind of subject matter depth on something that you care about. Because no one knows everything, but the beauty of being AG is that you can bring smart young people in, uh, or smart old people who have, you know. Uh, we got great judges who retired. We brought people from all ends of the spectrum, and we brought smart middle-aged people who had paid <laughs> off their law school loans. I know, I'm trying not to sound ageist here. Uh, uh, it, age doesn't matter. It's the energy involved. And, but 
uh, a, tra new, a track record of having accomplished yes, something. Yes, experience right? was important. Experience, yeah. So there's no one track to it, but you could look at most of the people I know who have been good AGs have done, often have done DA or prosecution work or defense work. If you look at Elisa Madigan in Chicago, uh, Kamala Harris, who's running for Senate, and I think she's going to win. Uh, in California. In California, was a district attorney in San Francisco and then ran for AG. She has a background somewhat similar to mine. Um, although she'll be successful in the Senate race, so that's good. Um, other AGs, you know, Doug Gansler from Maryland was in the U.S. Attorney's Office, so most of them have some mix of some kind of prosecution, public service, and some private sector experience. Or go work in an AG's office like Maura Healy, and then you can run. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Martha Coakley. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.